So what really happens when you type a URL into your browser? Hello and what's up guys, Medium Guy here and in this video we're going to see what actually happens when you click a URL or type a URL into your browser, what processes your browser has to make in order to make connections to servers and show you the content that you request for. So you open a browser every day and go to your preferred websites whether they be for social media, news or online shopping and by entering a URL or clicking on a link to the page you can access the content of that page. So the process involves the browser, your computer's operating system, your internet service provider and the server where your website is hosted and the service running on that server. So actually the actions your browser has to take after you click on a link, first it has to look up the location of the server hosting the website, then it has to make a connection to the server and send a request to get the specific page and then handle the response received from that server and lastly it has to go through how it renders the page so the viewer or you can interact with the website. So right before we jump into the steps that happens in the background when you visit a web page, we actually have to know about the terms like websites, servers and IP addresses. So actually websites are collections of files, often HTML, CSS, JavaScript or images that tell your browser how to display the web page. So they need to be accessible to anyone from anywhere at any time. So hosting them on your computer at your home isn't really scalable or reliable. So a powerful external computer connected to the internet is called a server that actually stores these files. So when you point your browser at a URL, your browser has to figure out which server on the internet is hosting that site. So it does this by looking up the domain to find the address. Every item connected to the internet has a special address known as an IP address, including servers and smartphones and any other devices. Four numerical parts make up an IP address like 1.0.168.192, but actually numbers like this are hard to remember. So that's where domain names come in. So like github.com is much easier to remember than 1.0.168. blah blah blah. So imagine having to remember all the phone numbers of your contacts without having the contacts app on your phone. So your contacts app lets you look up phone numbers by their names. And similarly on the internet, we follow the same procedure. So similar to your contacts app on your phone is the domain name system or DNS. DNS actually helps in locating servers on the internet. So now that we know about the different parts and how they relate to one another, let's look at each step of the process and how the browser communicates with the server when you type in a URL. So as you can see, a URL can have multiple parts, each with individual meanings. So as you can see in the picture, we have the scheme, the domain, the path, and the resource that we're requesting for. So the browser must determine which internet server to connect to when you type the URL. The browser actually looks up the IP address for that domain name. So as I mentioned, it does this using a DNS lookup and actually it can happen in different levels. So we have browser cache, the operating system, local network at your router, DNS server on a local network, and the internet service provider. So if the browser cannot find the IP address at any of those layers, the DNS server on your local network or at your ISP does a recursive DNS lookup. So it actually asks for multiple DNS servers around the internet, which in turn asks more DNS servers for the DNS record until it is found. So actually, if you imagine, how many numbers of domain names that we have all around the world. It is actually not optimal for a DNS server to store all that domain names in itself, knowing that it is so rare that a client would request for a specific domain name. So it actually stores the domain names that it is repeatedly asked for. So as a result, it can respond 
much faster. So after the IP address of the domain name is found, browser initiates a TCP connection with the server. Transmission control protocol, more formally known as TCP, is used throughout the public internet routing infrastructure to route packets from a client browser request through the router, the internet service provider, through an internet exchange, to switch ISPs or networks, and finally to find the server with the IP address to connect to. So once the browser finds the server on the internet, it establishes a TCP connection with the server and if HTTPS is being used, a TLS handshake takes place to secure the communication. So that is because HTTPS is the secured version of HTTP and it requires much more steps between a client and a server in order to make their connections in a secure way. So as you can see in the picture, a trace route to github.com has to go through multiple routers until it reaches to the actual IP address of the required domain name. So as you can see in the picture over here, a request to github.com has to go through multiple tasks in order to establish and receive the response from the server. So you can see the DNS resolution and the connecting, which is actually the time used for establishing the TCP connection. And next we have the TLS setup between the client, which is the browser, and the server, which is actually the server github.com is served on. So in order to request the content of a page, the browser first sends an HTTP request to the server. So a request line, headers, and a body make up an HTTP request. The server can determine what the client, in this case your browser, wants to do using the information in the request line. So as you can see, we have request methods, which can be one of get, post, put, and etc. A path pointing to the requested resource and the HTTP version to use. So HTTP headers let the client and the server pass additional information with the HTTP request or response. We can pass headers related to authentication, caching, cookies and course policies and etc. So next the last part of the request is the body for a request that manipulates resources like post, put or patch the body will contain the data from the client to create or update. So the request body can be in different formats and the server understands the format based on a request header which is content type. So the server takes the request and based on the information in the request line, headers and body decides how to process the request. So here you can see the request headers that are sent by the client and the response headers that are sent back from the server. So next as we can see the server processes the request and sends back a response. So an HTTP response is made by a server to a client based on the URL path headers and body that it receives from the request. The aim of the response is to provide the client with the resource it requested or inform the client that the action it requested has been carried out or else to inform the client that an error occurred in processing its request. So in this example, as we can see in the picture, the browser sent a GET request to the server on a specific path and the server responded with a JSON including the data for the browser to decide on what to do with this information. And on the next and the last step, the browser renders the content based on the response. So once the browser has received the response from the server, based on the content type of the response, browser knows what type of the data it received and what can it do with the data. So as a result, we now know that click on a link or enter a URL in your browser, the browser goes through the process of resolving that domain name and trying to make connection to that found address and after it makes the connection it sends a get request to the desired URL and based on the response which will most probably be in HTML format that it will receive from the server it will actually try to render that HTML and 
through rendering that HTML, it'll find links to other URLs, like for example, style CSS files or JavaScript files, images, or whatever API calls that it might need to make based on the JavaScripts that will be loaded in the browser. So actually it will go through the same process for each of these URLs and eventually receive all the responses for all these URLs. And finally, you will have a fully functioning web page loaded in your browser. So then you can view the images, you can read through the texts and interact with the buttons and inputs and any other interaction elements on your web page. So that's all for this video. I hope you learned something new in this one. And from now on, when you visit a website or use a mobile application, hopefully you will have in mind the processes that your clients have to go through in order to fetch all the information from these servers. And optimistically, you will have more information in which parts you have to debug if any errors occurred or any performance issues you have or anything like that. So each of these steps can actually have effects on the total response time that you experience in your client site. So a quick example, if the DNS server respond very slowly, as a result, your web page will load very slowly because it actually first needs to resolve the IP address of the domain you're visiting and then actually try to send requests to that exact server. So because of this reason, not all the performance issues are related to your servers or network infrastructures or totally things on your site. So that's all for now. Lastly, if you find this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe. And with that, I hope to see you in the next videos.